you turn with me, please, to John chapter 13? I'll be reading verses 3 through 5 and then jumping down to verse 12. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. In verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that in going to the cross, not only has Christ made provision for our sin, but he has left us an example also to follow. An example that needs to be emblazoned upon our minds, for it will always lead us to do as he did. For he is far greater than us, and yet he stooped so low to serve us. So we thank you for the fruit of the cross, both in its saving effect and in its sanctifying effect in our lives. And would you use your word tonight to teach us more about our Savior and more about how we can live like our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to have asked me what the largest producer of oxygen on the planet was, you're thinking to yourselves, okay, what is the largest producer of oxygen on the planet? Well, my mind went to the Amazon forest, the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest covers over a billion acres, encompassing areas in Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, and the eastern Andean region of Ecuador and Peru. If Amazonia were a country, it would be the ninth largest in the world. The Amazon rainforest has been described as the lungs of the planet because it provides the essential environmental world service of continuously recycling carbon dioxide into oxygen. More than 20% of the world's oxygen is produced by the Amazon rainforest. The rainforest is clearly an important part of the world's ecosystem. In fact, all the world's trees, plants, shrubs, and grasses, they account for about half of the world's oxygen, which it produces through the process which you all learned back in junior high called photosynthesis. For the other half of the world's oxygen, we can thank a tiny one-celled plant that lives in the ocean called phytoplankton. By taking in energy from the sun and nutrients from the water, phytoplankton does its important job of producing the majority of oxygen in the world. So just as oxygen is essential to our physical life on earth, there's something just as essential for our spiritual life, and that is the love of Christ. According to Paul, it, ha- it is something that we will never be separated from. Paul asks the critical question in Romans 8.35. He says, what will separate us from the love of Christ? To which he answers, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's prayer at the close of Ephesians chapter 3 is that we would be rooted in and grounded in love, and know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. 
We are to walk in love. We are to be controlled by the love of Christ. Jude says that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. Well, in chapter 13 here, we have been contemplating the love of God in Christ. In what is very likely John's account of the Last Supper, Christ's act of washing the disciples' feet gives both them and us a living illustration of the love of Christ for us in the cross. It's his love for the disciples that leads the Lord uh, and teacher to wash their feet, and it is his love for us that leads the Savior and the Redeemer to die in our place. Through the picture of kneeling and washing their feet, and through the reality of bleeding and dying on the cross, Jesus is creating a fellowship of those who have been cleansed by him. It's God's will, it's his desire that this this fellowship be characterized by the same self-denial that he had for the sake of those that he humbly and sacrificially served. See, if you want proof of Christ's love, there's no greater proof than the cross. If you want a picture of the character of Christ's love, well, there's no clearer picture than the cross. And if you want Christ's love produced in you, there's no stronger producer of that than the cross. So as we look at the last of three sermons on Christ washing the disciples' feet, I I, I hope to show you that the strongest producer of Christ's love in us is the cross. The strongest producer of Christ's love in us is the cross. As he explains to the disciples the implications of what he's done to them, we're going to see first a model of loving humility, followed by the means of living joyfully. So we begin in verses 12 through 16, seeking to understand what Jesus has done in giving us a model of loving humility. So John does this in four steps, showing us this model of loving humility. He shows it in four steps. First, Jesus gives us another explanation of of his actions. Then he gives us an exposition of loving humility. Jesus follows that with an example of loving humility. And then lastly, Jesus gives an expectation of loving humility. So we begin with Jesus giving us another explanation of his actions. He says in verse 12, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? Now, according to John's account of this event, the Lord gave the disciples two explanations of his washing of their feet. One was while he was washing Peter's feet, and then the other was was here after he had taken his seat again. His first explanation, which we looked at uh, the last time, was mostly theological in character. The actual foot washing was symbolic of what Jesus would do on the cross by humbling himself to endure the the death of the cross and the soul-cleansing results of his death for all who would believe in him. And so, in our passage today, in verses 12 through 17, the explanation is of a more practical nature. Jesus washed their feet so that from his example... These disciples may learn to serve one another in the same loving and humble fashion. Now, some people are troubled by this explanation here, thinking that this indicates uh, there is another author somehow involved in the writing of the Gospel of John, which I think is really unnecessary. We can see how this second explanation is appropriate by simply reminding ourselves of the conversation that that Luke says took place between the Lord and his disciples in the Last Supper, in Luke 22. There, as they, they were disputing over who was greatest, Jesus drew their attention to his own example. He was the greatest one present at the table, and yet he chose to serve them. In Mark's gospel, though, his account of that scene recalls how Jesus' examples, Jesus' example of humble service is brought into the closest association with his sacrifice on the cross. He tells them that if anyone wants to be first, he must be slave of all. Because even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So it seems only natural that that John brings 
both of these now together in his description of this scene. And it's one of the many ways that God has designed his word to show both its harmony as well as its consistency. Now notice, though, that, that Jesus desires these men, his disciples, as he desires it for us as well, he, he desires that we would understand the implications of his actions. Do you know what I've done for you, he says. See, when Peter refused to let the Lord wash his feet, Jesus told Peter that he would understand what he's done here. He said, you'll understand later. And as we've discussed, I think Jesus has his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in view here. That's all in view of what he's trying to get them to see and that they'll understand later. But the other lesson, that of demonstrating loving humility towards one another, that one's clear. This one is readily available. I want you guys to get this right now. I want you guys to understand this right now. The other you're going to understand later when the Spirit comes. This one, you need to understand this right now. He's given them a clear demonstration of that by his actions. And so while the cross is the, is the main picture here, it's soon going to come into very clear focus. In 24 hours, another much-needed lesson for these men can be grasped right here. The situation is a little different for us. We can see both of these things clearly. We can see the cross and we can see the practical example right here. So Paul, he masterfully tied together the cross with our need to serve one another in loving humility. And he does it in Philippians chapter 2. You're familiar with these verses where he said, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. He says in Philippians 2.8, he says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so this, this is the vantage point that I want us to work from, where the cross is in full view here. Even though it wasn't for them, it is for us. And this brings us to our first application. Center your life in the shadow of the cross. Center your life in the shadow of the cross. Jesus asks these men, do you know what I've done to you? There was no need to wait for an answer. They knew that their teacher and Lord had just performed the lowliest of services to them. What Jesus had done to these men in washing their feet, it has implications. What Jesus will do for these men on the cross, it has implications. And what Jesus has done for us on the cross, it has implications. And the key question for them, as well as for us, is do we know, do we understand, do we comprehend the implications of what Christ has done for us? Serving one another in loving humility is an absolutely essential component to our life as a Christian. But it doesn't stand just on its own. Jesus doesn't simply say, serve one another because I say so. Right? He doesn't do that. What our Lord is showing us here in a very small way through the foot washing, but in a far much greater way through the cross, is what is absolutely true of him in terms of his character, and it shall be true of all who follow him as well. Serving one another in loving humility is not simply a helpful ability or a skill that, you know, it would do good that we all learn that. No, as if, as if we were learning how to balance a checkbook or learning how to play a piano or something like that. That would be a good skill. You should pick that one up. No, in loving humility, Jesus serves these men in this way. And he goes to the cross for us. Why? Because he is humble. Because he is love. And what are the implications for us? We shall be that way or else we're not his followers. Now, I don't know about you, but serving others in loving humility, it does not come easily to me. If I put my mind to it, I can work hard, right? I could learn, let's say, to play the piano. 
And very likely, if I worked hard enough, I could learn to play it really well, maybe better than Neil. No amount of hard work, though, is going to make me more loving. No amount of hard work is going to make me more humble. These are issues of the heart. They're not, they're not simply of the mind. They're not of the will. Anyone can choose to do something that is humble and loving, but given what the Bible says about the human heart, we need to understand that that is not coming from a heart that is capable by itself of being that way. And this is why we must keep the cross central to our lives. The message of the cross, which is the, the gospel, is not only the basis for our salvation, it is the centerpiece of everything we are called to do and be as Christians. Paul is going to talk about joy as a Christian. He's going to tie it to the cross. If he's going to talk about Christian morality or fellowship, he will tie it to the cross. And if he wants to speak about the doctrine of God or anything else, he always ties it to the cross. The cross was at the center of all that Paul taught. He summed it up well when he said to the Corinthians that he was determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The cross, it's the means of our salvation and it is the means for our sanctification, our transformation into followers of Christ that are actually like Christ. We never move on from the gospel, never from the cross. It must remain central to our lives. It is, as Paul later said to the Corinthians, it is a matter of first importance. He says to them, Now I would, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. And Paul's, he's speaking here to Christians who are having trouble in a number of areas of their walk. And Paul says, You need to remember the gospel that I preached to you. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. See, he takes it to the cross. There are many callings, many possible areas of service in God's kingdom, but there's only one truth by which our lives, yours and mine, must be defined. This one simple truth, the gospel, is what should motivate every part of who we are and what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. More than any other truth, the cross is what we dwell on, we rejoice over, and we are motivated by. In other words, the cross must be our passion. In his book, The Cross-Centered Life, C.J. Mahaney quotes a favorite author of mine, Jerry Bridges, when he says this about the gospel. The gospel is not only the most important message in all of history, it is the only essential message in all of history. Do we see the truth of this? Many in the church, they want more practical messages. Maybe you want to hear me preach more about money management. I would not be the right person to preach that anyway. Maybe you want more... Some of you want uh, me to preach about meaningful relationships, how to be happy. These are all important biblical topics. Don't, don't get me wrong. But if we think that they are in some way beyond the cross, separate from the cross, then we have sadly misunderstood what the gospel is about. The gospel is the key to joy, to growth to passion in our walk with God. If the cross is not central to our life, then we have not only stopped growing as a Christian, we are actually sliding backwards, away from our Savior, away from the person and disciple that He wants to make us. So from there, Jesus now gives us an example of loving humility. He does this by bringing out the contrast between the lofty titles with which they refer to him and the lowly task now that he had just undertaken. He says in verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord and you're right, for so I am. If I then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. So there were respectful titles that reflected the role that he played in their lives. He was their teacher or rabbi, one from whom they desired to learn. They saw him as their Lord, one who was worthy of esteem and respect. And if this is truly how they viewed him, and they should accept, then they should accept his directions. They should apply his teachings, teachings that he gave them both by, by precept as well as by practice. And what might have been in their minds as Jesus offered his explanation What might have been in his mind as Jesus offered his explanation for his activity? It was not uncommon for disciples to perform various services for their rabbi as a way of showing their gratitude. Even so, a line had to be drawn somewhere. somewhere. One one rabbinic saying that dates back as far as 250 A.D. and likely even earlier, it drew it specifically at loosing the thong on a sandal. That's the lowest you should go in serving your rabbi. Undo the thong on his sandal. Now, where have you heard that? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist showed the greatness of Jesus by declaring that he was unworthy to perform even the lowest of tasks for Jesus. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal, and you all know what I'm saying. Here, though, we have Jesus performing what would be considered even lower than removing their shoes. And yet it is abundantly clear that none of his glory is diminished at all, even in the slightest. One quote I read said this, when a man stands on his dignity, he usually squashes it flat. See, we never see Jesus using his divine dignity to gain prestige or privilege, not so with his disciples, though, not, that was not the case with them. Where, what Jesus did here deliberately and yet also without hesitation, it doesn't diminish his dignity at all. In fact, it, it enhances it. His selfless act of service further manifested his glory as the word made flesh. And when it came to the well-being of others, nothing was beneath him. And now, as a result of his example in the upper room and on Mount Calvary, nothing should be beneath his followers either. He's not calling them to wash one another's feet as if he's establishing some new sacrament for the church, along, something to do alongside of baptism and communion. We don't, we don't wash one another's feet. He wasn't establishing that as a practice. No, this is a call to loving care for others that regards no task as too menial, no service as too great. Nothing is beneath us, and nothing should stand in our way of ministering humbly to all. So seeing their Lord and their teacher washing their feet, it was stunning enough, but once again, it's the cross that brings this lesson for us into into full scope. This is a lesson of how we are to relate, relate to others. Serve others in the shadow of the cross is our second application. Serve others in the shadow of the cross. David Pryor said, We never move on from the cross, only into a more profound understanding of the cross. We never move on from the cross. You may be a very different person from the sinner that you first, when you first heard the gospel, however long ago it was. But wherever you are at today in your journey with Christ, you have not moved on from the cross. If you want to grow and thrive as a Christian, which includes your relationship with people, don't look to the Spirit to take you anywhere else beyond the cross. Look to Him to take you more deeply into the cross. Regardless of your relationship to others, whether you're single, whether you're married, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a grandparent, Your faithfulness and effectiveness in your relationships are directly tied to your understanding of the cross. Love is absolutely essential in your relationships because sin is absolutely unavoidable in them. You will sin against others. They will sin against you. And you're going to need to forbear others, and you're going to need to forgive others. 
And as we are reminded in our passage tonight, we need to lovingly and humbly serve others. Your relationship with others must be based on your relationship with God through the cross. In chapter 4, verse 32 of Ephesians, he said, Paul says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. There is much application that can be drawn just from this verse, but let me limit it just to the context of our passage here that we're in. When I become prideful and lazy and selfish, I am also assuming that I deserve to be served. And keeping the cross at the center of my life and in the center of my relationships with others, it will absolutely crush this mindset. And at the same time, it will transform it to what it needs to be. As I stand, so to speak, in the, in the shadow of the cross, it is there that I will be starkly reminded that I have no business doing anything from selfish or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, I must regard others as more important than myself. Why will this be my, re my response to the cross? Because on the cross, I'm going to see this attitude in my Savior, who although He was God, Although he was worthy of all glory and honor, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being found in the likeness of men. So in the shadow of the cross, I'm going to see the mighty God who willingly humbled himself to become a man. But he did not stop there. He washed the feet of the men he created. But more so than that, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. See, God served us in loving humility on the cross so we can serve others also in loving humility. We must not make the mistake of thinking that the motivation to love and to serve others is ever going to be found in people. If we do that, we will be forever looking and never serving. The strongest producer of Christ's love in us is only the cross. Nothing else will ever come close. So after offering himself as the example of loving humility, Jesus then turns to those who would follow him and he presents his expectation of loving humility. In verse 16, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. So this is actually a common phrase of Jesus, that a slave was not greater than his master. He says it in John 15, verse 20. He says it also in Matthew 10, in Luke 6. What is it the slaves are to do? Well, they are to obey their master. What is it that, that one who is sent must do? Well, he must do what he's been told. So Jesus' point here is unmistakable. If their Lord, whom they are both to obey and heed, did not think it beneath his dignity to serve them through such a menial task, why should we ever think it beneath our dignity to serve one another with the same mindset? Many years later, the Apostle Peter wrote a letter to God's persecuted people during those terrible days when Nero was on the rampage, when, when savage and terrible things were being done to the saints of God, and not only in Rome, but far and wide across the Roman Empire, Peter had many helpful words for those who were facing this fiery trial. To the younger members of the fellowship, he wrote, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Now, the word here, clothe, that Peter uses, it comes from the root word meaning knotted, or to be clothed in a garment that was tied on. The noun referred to the garment of a slave, and don't you wonder, as Peter had wrote these words, did he have in his mind's eye 
that unforgettable sight of the Lord Jesus. Just before he went to face the cross, tying a towel about his waist, wearing the garment of a slave, coming to him and saying, Now then, Peter, let me wash your feet. See, he saw his Lord clothed with humility. And he reminds us that we are to be clothed in the same way. A third application is suffer well and do good in the shadow of the cross. Suffer well and do good in the shadow of the cross. Jesus knew what was coming for these men. He wanted to equip them with all that they needed. And as we can once again see from Peter, God's plan for us, it's very likely going to include suffering. Sometimes this will simply be a prolonged season that's, that's uncomfortable. At other times, our suffering may be difficult and may even be severe. Where then does Peter go to bring hope and comfort and encouragement to those who are suffering for Christ? Where does he go? He goes to the cross. He reminds them of the cross. To many of us, Too many of us are not prepared theologically for suffering. We're just not. And so when we do suffer, instead of trusting God, we just complain. We charge God with wrong. We demand that he explain himself. Peter, as we will see, even explains suffering as a part of God's divine purpose. And yet there is still a bit of mystery to it all. And even though I can't fully grasp its meaning or its purpose, I can find true comfort from looking to the suffering of the one and only truly innocent and righteous one. And that's exactly where Peter points us. 1 Peter 2, 21, he says, For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. See, take note that Jesus did not simply suffer for our salvation. His suffering was meant to be an example, a template of how we are to suffer. How is it an example? Well, While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus suffered well, and he did good. Remember as well that even on this night, Jesus washed the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. And now since since we're not above our master, we, we are called to do the same even if it means doing good to those who hate us. Now, this seems impossible to me, but by faith, I know it can be possible because of the cross. The cross serves as both the vehicle and the fuel for a changed life, a life in which we die to sin and we live to righteousness, a life in which love is produced in us when hatred might otherwise dominate. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. So when life gets difficult and things don't go as as we would like, that is when we need to have the cross central to our lives. Comfort in suffering is never going to be found by focusing endlessly on the suffering itself. Because in suffering, For for in suffering, there's always that impenetrable element of mystery that we're going to get hung up on. Why, God, are you allowing this? But if we will meditate instead on the cross, there we can find true hope, true comfort, and the strength as well to persevere in the difficulties and the painful seasons of the Christian life. So having pointed to himself as as the model of loving humility, Jesus now gives us the means to living joyfully. 
He says in verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Don't expect the world to see the wisdom in taking such a humble place. Consider, though, who was the happiest person in the room that evening, that night. Was it Peter? Peter certainly wasn't. No, he was most likely chiding himself for, for not having thought to be the first person in the room so that he could wash all their feet. I should have thought of this. Judas certainly wasn't the happiest person in the room. No, he was sitting there with his ill-gotten gains in his hands. Paranoia was beginning to set in that his plot might be discovered. Surely Jesus was the happiest person even though his immediate future was the bleakest. Happiness, it doesn't consist in knowing, but in doing, Jesus said. This beatitude, this, this promise of living joyfully regardless of the circumstances, it will not be true for us until we are no longer content just to sit and listen and approve what is right. We must do it. This is the character of those who Jesus says will be in heaven. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Jesus says, this is what the wise man will do. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus says, this is what the true disciple will do. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So let me end by, by giving you an example that I, I hope will in, in some way help us to see that however low we stoop to humbly and lovingly serve others, it won't come even remotely close to the infinite distance Christ chose to stoop to humbly and lovingly serve you and me. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. It's always fun to try to to put into perspective the size of our galaxy. There's, everybody makes some attempt at it in some way. Let me make one attempt here. Say that there are one million grains of salt in a, in a container of salt. So if, if we poured out all the salt, those one million granules of salt that are in one container, if we poured out all, all the salt in 100,000 containers, we would have a rough equivalent of the number of stars that are in our galaxy. One billion stars, let's just say, in our galaxy. In order for us to comprehend the size of the galaxy in which God has placed all those stars, it would require, it would require us to take every one of those grains of salt, those billion grains of salt, and put seven miles between every grain. That's how vast our galaxy is. But that's just one of millions of galaxies that astronomers believe are in our universe. And within our galaxy is our, so, uh, in our, is our solar system with nine planets that are orbiting, orbiting around a star which we call the sun. And yet our sun, let alone our solar system, is actually minuscule in size when compared to the largest known star, Canis Majoris. It's about 5,000 light years from our planet. This star is so large, it just, it just simply boggles the mind. The best comparison that I found is to say that, that if we were to walk around the Earth, the entire Earth, at five miles per hour, for eight hours a day, it would take us two years and 11 months to get around the earth. If we were to do the same on Canis Majoris, it would take 650,000 years. Two years for the planet Earth, almost three. 650,000 for Canis Majoris. 
and it's just sitting out there in space somewhere. It is 1,300 of our suns could fit across the diameter of this massive star. So this is just one of those very brief glimpses of the glory of God in creation. And yet the God who created such a massive glory has humbled himself to come to this minuscule planet in this tiny solar system. And somehow this, this glorious God, he was able to clothe himself in flesh and bone. And he walked amongst us. And he loved us greatly. And he served us humbly. And then at the fullness of time, he died for us on this rough wooden cross. And the greatness of the glory of our God, as incomprehensible as it is to us, it can be seen in how far he was willing to stoop for those that he had chosen to love, but were in practice his enemies. To those of us that he has rescued out of our sin, he now says, go and do the same. See, if you think it's impossible to comprehend the size of Canis Majoris, Try living this way in your own strength. That's even more impossible. You will only be able to do this as you keep the cross central to your life. Because this cross is the strongest producer of Christ's love in us. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this much-needed reminder of how central your death for us must be. We could never plumb the depths of understanding what you have done, but you have given us such a very simple and clear example in the washing of the feet of the disciples. We are to serve one another, and nothing that we do is too low. There is no task too menial, no service too great for us to do in lovingly serving one another. I need to see this in my life, and I'm sure my brothers and sisters need to see more of it in theirs. So help us to go and to do the same in the power of your spirit and in view of your cross. Please, in Jesus' name, amen.